What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final, final little pass is a business. Hey everybody, welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're a boyfriend and girlfriend, and we like to get scared together. Yeah, we do. If you're listening to this, you don't know this, but we have a new set, finally, and new cameras. Yeah, new cameras that aren't crappy webcams that are constantly adjusting their yeah. exposure and white balance. It looks a lot better. better. <laughs> We've got our little set. We're basically using the the kill count set, but I added some stuff. So. Oh, oh but Chelsea, uh, Michael Myers's mask is in the background of my frame. Is that a hint? Is that a hint of something we're going to be doing in the future? It's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> she looked really confused for a second. I was like, no, 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 I'm making a joke. It's okay. Well, actually. That's kind of a hint for what we're doing today. A little bit, yeah. Because what are we doing today? Today we're going to talk about horror movies that changed the genre. Yeah. And this isn't necessarily the best horror movies. It's just the movies that maybe indicated a shift in what horror was and what horror would be after that movie came out. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, I mean, you're the one who did all the research, you always do for the podcast, uh, but one of the things that I had in mind when kind of just consulting for this list was films that sparked a movement mm -hmm. or like a change in the genre, an inflection point, mm -hmm. if you will, which is a term that's used all the time in politics and stuff. I still don't know the exact definition of it, but it seems to make sense here. An inflection point in the genre, a movie that came out and like the movies that came out after it hearkened back to it in a way right yeah and you know this list was really hard to put together so there's gonna be ones that you think should be on here that aren't and that's fine the yeah. more i started to research this the longer this kept getting so i had to be a little careful because this thing could be four hours long <laughs> missing from this list a nightmare on elm street yeah exactly which that one could maybe be but like i don't feel as though after nightmare on elm street came out that there was this sudden influx of like fantastical slashers yeah and maybe i'm wrong because like it came out mid '80s, and I feel like the late '80s is kind of a blind spot for me for horror movies because I just feel like it's fucking sequels. That's all it is. Yeah. So uh, Nightmare is missing. But... You you could argue that Nightmare gave us Chucky. Ooh, maybe because you know the idea of a horror villain that's funny. That's true. So he could oh, shit. feasibly. You know what? This, it could have been on here. Yeah. This is why doing the research <laughs> for this is really hard because there's so many reasons so many movies could be on here. So yeah. I can't include them all. So yes, Nightmare, sure, we could have put on here as the, yeah. the wise cracking the wise villain cracking that you kind of root for. Mm -hmm. But all those caveats aside now, uh, I think we can begin with what should be everyone's like guess as to the first movie on yeah. this list. Yeah, Psycho. That's We're right. We're going to start with Psycho, which, you know, it, I think most people, most like film critics, film historians would say that's the beginning of modern horror. The so modern we're horror. We're starting yeah. with modern horror because admittedly, I don't know a ton about movies that came before Psycho. Yeah. Because before that, you've got like Vincent Price stuff. You got the Universal Monsters, the, the Hammer, Hammer films. So it's... And even going... I mean, horror is... Has, 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 horror has existed as long as the art of filmmaking has but right. Nosferatu is from the 20s right so yeah uh but as far as modern horror goes yeah Psycho seems to be ground zero for it yeah I think so it's uh you know we've got violence and sex mm -hmm. used in horror for the, you know explicitly I feel like for the first time in a big mainstream movie I think that's kind of the key is that it was a uh, mainstream movie made by a respectable quote unquote mm -hmm. filmmaker alfred hitchcock had already uh was already very well known oh yeah he already at this point had done rear window vertigo yeah don't forget alfred hitchcock started in the silent era he made silent films he made talking films and his work extended into the color film era hitchcock just spanned the whole fucking yeah, yeah, that is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Weirdly, Psycho was made after he started doing color films. Yep. I think a lot of people think maybe it's an early one because it's black and white. But no, this is like, you know, peak Hitchcock. He's done all these like spectacular color films that are like huge, grandiose, like big name cast, big budget. 
And then he wants to make Psycho and he is having a hard time finding funding for it because it is inappropriate. It's based on a book. So the studios, I think he wanted Paramount to produce it and they were like, eh, we're, we're, we're super not into this. We'd rather have you make this other movie. I think they were trying to get him to do a movie with Audrey Hepburn. Okay. Um, but she was pregnant, so she couldn't. So Hitchcock was like, all right, I'm just going to front a ton of my own money and film this thing in black and white because it's cheaper. Wow. And then the black and white enables him to be a little bit more violent because blood in black and white isn't as visceral as blood in color. For sure. It's sometimes in my thumbnails for my videos, I will reduce the saturation if it's a bloody image because uh, YouTube doesn't like too much violence in their thumbnails. So if it's like a bloody face, I'll just reduce that saturation, take out that red. It works. And also the, I think maybe a lot of people know this if you're a film geek, but the blood in Psycho is chocolate syrup. And I think that's a lot of fun. For sure. Yeah. And on the black and white note, for people who their main experience with film is the horror genre, as it was for me as as a younger person, uh, this movie wrongfully led me to believe that black and white movies were the norm well into the 60s because this is 1960 and it's black and white. So yeah. my thought was always, oh, color didn't come until much later than that. But mm. color, I think, became the norm in film in the 50s. Psycho coming out in black and white was not the norm. No. It would have been expected to have been in color at this point. So mm-hmm. just so you know, because I remember when I was doing Black Christmas, which was 1974, someone was like, that's that's from 1974. It's really old. Is it black and white? I was like, no. And yeah. like black and white was phased out pretty much by this point. But yeah. Just so you know. It's it's weird. And this is getting into like nerdy, nerdy <laughs> shit. But within film, like the industry itself and among film critics, there was a big rift between people who thought film should always be in black and white and color. Every time a technology every, comes Every around. time we come up with a new technology. Sound. Sound, yep, sound. There was a big debate over whether or not sound took away from yeah. cinema, the experience and, of film. And no one's immune to it. I feel like we're pretty snobbish about 3D. Yeah. Like, fuck 3D. Yeah. The, I mean, I think it's or in the Or um, digital versus digital, shooting on go. film. I feel mm-hmm. like that's maybe a, a really good comparison to like the shift into color. Another yeah. thing that we're snobby about. Yeah. Film looks better. I'm sorry. It does. <laughs> yeah, it does. Especially oh, with some of these movies. I'm like, oh, they're shot on film and they're so beautiful. Oh, so beautiful. Um, what else did Psycho do? It killed that off really... its main character. Oh, yeah. 45 minutes in. <laughs> In the most famous scene ever. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's the shower scene. Everyone's seen it. The soundtrack, the shots, everything. Everything is is just replicated uh, so much throughout the past, oh, my God, almost 60 years now. The score goes on to influence so many horror movies. That's Bernard Herrmann, right? Oh, I think. Yes, I think so. Yeah. uh, Regular. He was the John Williams to Hitchcock's Spielberg, I believe. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the Psycho score, I would even say its closest comparison to like stuff that comes after is Jaws, just super simple, but instantly memorable and parodied Yeah, in so many different ways. And done in a way to be less melodic and more... Um, atmosphere. Atmosphere and just evocative. Yeah. Yeah. It creates a feeling more than a melody. Yeah. Yeah. We also get the use of POV camera with mm-hmm. Norman Bates. I think a lot of people think they, they refer to that as the Michael Myers shot. But Michael Norman, Myers Norman shot. Bates was doing that first. Yeah. And I mean, it's in Black Christmas. It's in Friday the 13th. Yep. It's in it's in horror movies. Yep. Hi, Lucy. Oh, Lucy's joining oh my us. Gosh. Is she right in front of your camera? That's, yeah. That's adorable. Hopefully she doesn't knock it down. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh uh but yeah pov shot also creates sympathy for the killer you're being put in his shoes it does put you in the killer's perspective so when the killer is stabbing her in the shower it's almost as though you are when psycho was made a man was arrested for murder in los angeles and he had confessed to killing three women The last murder he committed, he said, was influenced by the fact that he had just seen Psycho. So naturally, the newspapers got on to me and asked for my comment. And I said, what film did he see when he murdered the second woman? It's like it's like in a video game when you're you're the first person perspective, the things that are happening on screen, you just intuitively uh, 
think that you're the one doing it because it's your point of view. Yeah, and and that's something that so often gets video games in trouble where you're playing someone like who's murdering people. Like I think yeah. there was a Texas Chainsaw video game that stores wouldn't carry because you play Leatherface in it. Yeah. So you're just killing people. Yeah. And so this is like an earlier version of that where you're being put in the shoes of the killer. And so, you know, subconsciously you're going to, you're going to like root for him a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Another movie that did that very early on was Peeping Tom. Yes. I Peeping it was, Tom. But, uh... Look out for Carl Byrne as the Peeping Tom. Fear him, but pity him also. Oh, Peeping Tom's a lot of fun. Anything else to say about Psycho? Because we got a lot on this list. I know. I don't want to spend too but, much time I mean, on this, it. I mean, oh, Psycho here's the last thing off. about Psycho. Uh, first movie with a flushing toilet. <laughs> that's a fun, fun little, that's like a bar trivia thing to know. Yeah, there you go. Hi, Lucy. Uh, Lucy wants us to talk about the next film on the list. Oh, is she a fan? Uh, Yeah. So our next film is the one that maybe people are like, what? I didn't know this movie. And I study uh, horror is my job. No one talks about it. So this movie is Blood Feast, released in 1963. And the reason it's on here is it's because it's the first quote unquote splatter film. So this is the first movie, wide release movie that is like gory. You see the gore. You see the violence. It's in color. You got red, red blood. Like it's supposed to, I guess the director who's in it, Herschel Gordon Lewis, he saw Psycho and was like, that's good, but I want more. I want to see this lady get <laughs> murdered. So he went and made a movie where he felt satisfied by the violence. You see it all happen. This picture, truly one of the most unusual ever filmed, contains scenes which under no circumstances should be viewed by anyone with a heart condition or anyone who is easily upset. Now, you said this was a wide release movie. How mainstream was this? Um, That's a good question. I actually don't know. Okay. Because you mentioned it's very short. It's like 70 minutes. Uh, yeah. It's like an hour long. Yeah. Barely uh, barely feature length. Yeah. So I think maybe what I meant by wide release is like this was in theaters. Okay. Fair enough. You know, it's hard, especially early movies like that. That gets into like knowing how the business worked and stuff and distribution was different. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but 1963 is very early. I mean, I will say that Blood Feast, if you look it up, you find so many horror directors saying, like, this movie sucks. Like, it, it's not good. It sucks, but it's the first to do what it did. And that's why it should be remembered as something that's influential. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I probably should, since we're talking about yeah. it. It's about a food caterer that kills women so he can use them in rituals for his Egyptian goddess that he worships. So that's All right. Fine. I would watch it. Glad they kept the plot simple. <laughs> <laughs> so the next big movie we have on here is one of our favorites. Yep. It's in my top five. It was uh, one of the first kill counts I did. Mm -hmm. Night of the Living Dead. That's right. And Night of the Living Dead, I could easily do a whole episode on mm -hmm. because this movie is so important and there's so much going on. A lot of things that even Romero is like, is it really? Like, do I did I like put all this subtext in it? Okay, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Maybe the number one reason it's on here and like the simplest reason is uh, we get zombies. It made zombies. Yeah. And I mentioned this in the kill count, but we, we can talk about it more in depth here is that like it made zombies. Yep. Like it liter literally any zombie stuff that you watch nowadays is because of this yep. or it takes its version of zombies from this. Yeah. We don't have zombies as we know them mm -hmm. without Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, because before this is like voodoo based. Voodoo, they're voodoo based and they, you know, were were animated humans that were controlled by someone yeah. via magic and they weren't, you know, kind of autonomous and going around eating people. It was very different. Yeah. I feel like they were more like uh maybe like henchmen to to uh bigger voodoo villains, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, that ever all well, that changed after this, man. It's the first indie movie that was successful on the scale that it was. Psycho was technically indie, but it's Hitchcock. He has a career. He's it's, super famous. Psycho is indie, like how Star Wars is indie. Yeah, Star Wars is technically an independent film. Yeah, but uh... <laughs> yeah, Alfred Hitchcock is able to be like, "Hey, Universal Studios, let me build a set on your lot, which is still there. Yeah, you can see it on the tram tour at Universal." <laughs> with Norman Bates himself putting a dead body in a car. <laughs> and then chasing after you with a knife. Oh, man, we fucking love that tram tour. Love that tram tour. But yeah, so this is like an indie, indie movie. No one knows who Romero is. 
It's a bunch of unknowns. It's a bunch of, you know, basically kids just making a movie. Yeah. This is uh, definitely an aspirational movie or inspirational as well. Yeah. Just like this is this is people who wanted to make a movie and they made a movie in Pennsylvania. You know how you know it's super indie is because they couldn't really afford a great lawyer. So something got fucked up with the copyright of Night of the Living Dead. And it, I think just this year, went back to being you know someone has the rights to it yeah, now it was, it was public, public domain. domain for years for decades so you'll you'll see it in a lot of other movies like playing on the tv uh in thanks killing for instance mm-hmm. when i covered it i pointed it out because it's yeah it was in the public domain which meant there wasn't a copyright holder anyone could just use it yeah just because of like a filing error yeah and someone just fucked up yeah, and when we talked to uh, Judith O'Dea. Yeah, who plays Barbara. Yeah. She, that came up. She was like, it just, you know, we finally got the rights back to it. And she said she would go to the movies with friends and like, oh, look, there's me in the background of a shot. <laughs> because she was always on people's TVs and movies and stuff because they didn't have to pay to use her image. It's good for the people who made the film. Yeah, the, one of the get, most classic films yeah. to finally get something from it. I highly recommend going and getting the Criterion Collection Edition that just came out because it's like the first real version of this that's come out. That's it's, not it's a the first leg. under that copyright, and that's the one that we got at Monster Palooza and had uh, all the ladies sign. Yeah, so very proud of that. They were the best. Uh, but the ladies weren't the striking casting of this movie. It featured a uh, person of color as the lead, mm-hmm. Dwayne Jones. Dwayne Jones. A black man. Yeah. In 1968. This is in the middle of the civil rights era. This is some intense, uh, intense fucking time. And that's part of why this movie uh, works so well is it, it came out in 1968, which most people will say is the craziest year yeah. of American history, of modern American history, mm-hmm. just because of all the stuff going on, the the political turmoil, yeah, the assassinations. Yeah, I was going to say riots. Riots, riots, everything. So then here you have this main character who this role wasn't written to be a black man. He was just written to be, I think, a truck driver. Hmm. And Dwayne Jones comes in and auditions and Romero cast him because he was amazing. Yeah. And didn't change a thing about this character. Yeah, they didn't rewrite anything to reflect his his race. Yeah. So, so that's why it's never addressed. It's never addressed, which is huge. Mm-hmm. Still, we have issues with that. Just letting, you know, characters be characters, letting people of color be characters without having their skin color be part of the story, Mm -hmm. you know? But yeah, that the way it was written and then cast, you know, makes this character, it frees it from stereotypes and tropes. He just gets to be a guy. I realized that I was alone with 50 or 60 of those things just standing there staring at me. And yet still, be just because of the history mm-hmm. of our country, and especially at this point in time, there's a lot that you can read into with it. Yes. And Jordan Peele, I, I see that you wrote uh, his response to it, because mm-hmm. when he came out with Get Out, got a lot of comparison to Night of the Living Dead, so why did those kill counts back to back? But Jordan Peele acknowledged that Romero didn't set out to make any statements on race, yeah. since the character wasn't written as a black man, but still it happens. I found this... Uh, so So... It's, I think we should explain the end of Night of the Living Dead really quickly if you haven't seen it. Um, so, you know, everyone's holed up in this farmhouse together, all the survivors of this zombie apocalypse, pretty much. There's zombies. I think everyone's dead at this point except Dwayne Jones. Yep. So there's zombies. And the police and military show up and they think that Dwayne Jones is a zombie and they shoot him and he dies. And that's the end of the movie. Yeah. It's it super cops, bleak. Cops shooting and killing a black cops. man. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah they and they're sh- like, they're like rural cops, yeah. you know, it's loaded imagery. It's very low. Um, Romero. Yeah. Again, is, is like, eh, I didn't really mean any of that, but it's, it's imagery that really sticks with people because there's just the way that, you know what happened to be cast and, and written? Yeah. And so, yeah, I found this New York Times interview with Jordan Peele where so they, they ask, Night of the Living Dead is one of the few classic horror films about race, but its director, George Romero, said he didn't intend it to be. I partially believe Romero, but even if that's true, the way that movie handles race is so essential to what makes it great. All social norms break down when this event happens, and a black man is caged up in a house with a white woman who is terrified. But you're not sure how much she's terrified at the monsters on the outside or this man on the inside who is now the hero. Also, the end of the movie, that's nothing if it's a white dude. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still bleak, but it doesn't have any of the social 
uh, implications or, or just weight yeah. of how it is. And then I think right after they wrapped this movie, I don't even know if this had come out yet, oh. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. Yeah. So it's just, even if none of it was intended, it's inseparable from this movie. Yeah. Uh, aside from all that, we got some zombies eating, eating body Cannibalism. Parts. I think that's a big first for this movie. True. Cannibalism of a daughter eating her mother. Yeah, that scene <laughs> will forever stick out to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, everyone dies. That's <laughs> not normal for the time. And yeah, the portrayal of, of, of ineffective military and police. I think it's a bit of a, a taboo or a bit of a no-no to kind of portray the police as as stupid or bumbling or you know anything except american heroes yeah so night of the living dead is a huge one Mm -hmm. uh again another movie again that where it's black and white because of money yeah because it's way cheaper to shoot on black and white so if you're if again if your exposure to film is through horror movies you're like oh psycho and night of the living dead movies were black and white in the 60s yeah exactly (laughs) but yeah there's man i could i could talk about this movie forever i just want to do a whole episode on it yeah it's it's great if you haven't seen it go watch it uh lags a little bit in the middle but that's it yeah aside from that it's great Mm -hmm. very good movie it's the thing where once you watch it you'll see references to it everywhere that you never knew were references Mm -hmm. next i have one of my other favorites texas chainsaw massacre released in 1974 yeah I feel like Leatherface is kind of the the daddy of (laughs) all the killers we know and love in modern horror. You know, like the big, you know, you got him, you got Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers, like just all the big hulking, silent, faceless dudes. Mm -hmm. You don't get those without Leatherface. Yeah. And I feel like he doesn't get as much recognition as, say, Michael Myers, because this came out four years before Halloween. As a horror fan, uh, it's fun to be pedantic sometimes. And the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, chainsaw is two words. Do you know that? Isn't that weird? That is weird. It's real weird. It's like realizing Spider-Man has a hyphen Mm -hmm. in there. Yeah, it's always been there. Huh. (laughs) Yeah, this movie, speaking of chainsaws, it introduced power tools as a as a weapon. Oh, really? Yes, like that wasn't really a trope before, but now when you think, okay, like serial killer weapons or like movie killer weapons, chainsaws mm-hmm. up there. Yeah, it's, it's funny because a lot of uh, non-horror fans wrongly assume that the hockey mask killer has a chainsaw. It's, it's yeah. those two facets of serial killers that have just been kind of meshed together uh, I'm thinking specifically of the Simpsons episode where he busts into Homer oh, busts yeah. into Bart room. He's like, <laughs> "You want to see my new chainsaw and hockey mask?" Uh, but no, the, those two have never met before. Yeah, <laughs> and this is also just one of the first uh, slashers in like a cla- like classic slasher form. Got like our final girl. Yeah, you got a group of victims who yep. are getting picked off one by group one. Group of teens specifically. True. true, true. But yeah, you don't get the like slasher craze or Halloween without Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, and this came out the same year as Black Christmas, but I think a few months earlier. I think this was a okay. summer release, whereas Black Christmas was presumably okay. around the holidays. Yeah, I do have somewhere on here shout outs to Black Christmas because mm-hmm. it should be. That's like one of the first slashers. And yet Texas Chainsaw Massacre is not in the same. I I hesitate to put it strictly in the slasher subgenre mm-hmm. alongside Black Christmas, Halloween, Friday the 13th, etc. Mm-hmm. It it feels much more gritty. Well, yeah, that's um, you know, one of my notes here is that it's way more grounded than stuff like Halloween. There's no question of whether or not Leatherface is supernatural. He's like a dude. Yeah. And and Michael Myers is maybe magic. Oh yeah, maybe supernatural. <laughs> he gets shot a whole bunch. And Same just... with Jason Voorhees. It's mm-hmm. like what he's like a, a zombie. Basically, uh, well, that's from part six onward. But, but yeah, it's yeah. you know, <laughs> um, yeah, that's why you know I think both Texas Chainsaw and Halloween have to be on here. Texas Chainsaw kind of laid a lot of the groundwork for that, even though it doesn't fit as neatly into the definition of maybe what we think of as a slasher. Yeah, and. We'll talk about more with Halloween, but I feel like those other slashers that we're talking about here uh, seems to be kind of like this could happen to anyone, whereas Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you could kind of argue that these uh, kids bring it upon themselves, maybe, because they're on this road trip. They pick up a hitchhiker. They pick up a hitchhiker. They're freewheeling. They're like kind of hippie-esque, right? Yeah. You know, they're dirty hippie I kids. Could see, yeah, I could see the difference between, you know, other slashers it's like it's happening just they're living their lives and it happens to them whereas texas chainsaw they kind of drive to it 
Mm -hmm. a little bit. That's yeah. interesting. They're strangers in a in a strange land, and this happens to them. But, yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, because it, it's just so weird. Because it's just in my mind, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Massacre is separate from those others. Hmm. I I'm not even sure if I would call this slasher. Would you? I don't think I. If, you know, I, no. I don't think I would, but I think you don't have slashers without it. For sure. Of course. Of course. And it can be kind of a slasher. You know, it's uh, everything's everything yeah. to some degree. But you wrote here exploitation. Yeah, it's it's horror as exploitation, which you start really getting in the 70s. I have honorable mention for Last House on the Left, stuff like that, where it's like we're going from, you know, the 60s where we have stuff, you know, like Peeping Tom or night of the living dead where it's a little more fantastical mm -hmm. and kind of weird like peeping tom is really heightened if i remember correctly i saw it in college it's been a while but texas chainsaw and last house people are thinking these are real maybe yes no one's thinking peeping tom is real no one's thinking night of the living dead is no one's thinking these movies from the 60s are real texas chainsaw i think i mentioned this in the pilot of the podcast but this looks like you found this film in someone's garage yeah like it feels like you shouldn't be watching it yes that's the same with last house it. last house feels like a snuff film mm -hmm. it's like super super grounded and it's really exploitive violence uh on women especially yeah it won't hurt none my old grandpa is the best killer there ever was Men tend to die pretty quickly, especially in Texas Chainsaw. They're off pretty quickly, whereas the women, like you've got the faint, like the meat hook murder is oh drawn God. out and horrifying, even though you don't really see anything. Yeah. That's the cool thing about Texas Chainsaw is you don't actually see much. There's, yeah. It's not as graphic as you would be led to believe. No. I mean, it, it's still pretty. It's violent. For it sure. is. Yeah. But it's not like, you know, a gore fest. After that, we have. Oh, boy. Jaws. Jaws. Oh my God. Talk about a movie that not only, out of all the movies on this list, I think that Jaws is the one that had the biggest impact on film as a whole. Agreed. Not just the horror genre. Yep. Jaws fucking changed everything. Yep. Their film is basically, you know, the modern era of film is pre Jaws and post Jaws. Yeah. And I, I think maybe. Some people argue Jaws isn't a horror. Oh, yeah. They'll say that about anything. Jaws is a horror, you guys. It's, it's a just, monster movie. The thing is, the reason maybe some of you don't think it's a horror is because it's a very mainstream friendly horror. Yeah. And which that's is part of it. why it changed film. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was, the thing is, is Jaws, it was must see film. Like it was a must see movie. And this is when TV's starting to edge out film because TV's so much more convenient. And uh, so this is when, like, okay, it's the 70s. That's when everyone's starting to make crazy shit. That's why you get stuff like Texas Chainsaw and Last House, because everyone's like, all right, people aren't going to the movies. Let's make some really fucked up shit so people want to come see what this fucked up movie's about, you know? Yeah, I fucking love the 70s. The 70s is, is, like, my favorite era of film, because everything just gets so crazy. Yeah. So you get stuff like, I don't know, that's the 60s. Never mind. It's like an easy rider. Like New Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Never mind. So then Jaws is this horror movie that goes the opposite direction that Texas Chainsaw and its ilk do. Jaws is adult enough to be really enticing, but it's also really mainstream friendly horror. It's got that Spielberg tone to it. Where, yes. uh, and, you know, I think as his career has continued, he uh, combines these kind of aspects less. He kind of has his serious films now and then his like more fan uh whimsical films now but in early spielberg there's just this combination of that there's mm -hmm. like and even in films that he like produced didn't necessarily direct like poltergeist there's there's like the serious side mixed with this like yeah kind of whimsy wonder mm -hmm. um you you just you were watching jaws I watched last jaws night yesterday yeah to like review for this even and just the ending of jaws is so different than the ending of Texas Chainsaw, where like, yeah, we have a survivor at the end of Chainsaw, and we have two survivors at the end of Jaws, but the tone is so different. So in Jaws, you have uh, Brody and... Uh, Quint? No, no not Quint. Quint, guys. Quint Cooper. Cooper. Is it Hooper or Cooper? Oh. You have, you have Richard Dreyfus and I can't remember his character name, and Brody swimming away on the... They're like floating away, and they have a little like... I used to hate the water. <laughs> I can't imagine why. You have a feeling they're going to be all right. 
They save the day. The shark's gone. No one has PTSD after <laughs> Jaws. Everything's fine. Yeah. Texas Chainsaw, you have our final girl who's being driven away in the bed of a truck that she hops on and she's screaming and you have Leatherface swinging around his chainsaw, which is like one of my favorite scenes in any movie. <laughs> So you have a survivor in this situation too, but this girl is fucked up forever. Yeah. It's not a Hollywood ending. It's not a nice ending. Jaws is like very friendly. This is like a mainstream. You have a happy ending. Everything is resolved. Mm -hmm. And that's that. It's very clean. You know, you're not going home thinking about how fucked up these two dudes are going to be after fighting the shark and watching Quint get eaten. Yeah. No, you're just happy that they uh, they did it. Yeah. They succeeded. You got John Williams making music that makes you feel real good. Yeah, that's exactly. that's what he does. But then, so Jaws makes a shit ton of money. Oh, my God, guys. And it is responsible for blockbusters and event cinema. The way movies are today, when you think of, like, summer blockbuster, yeah. superhero movies, all that kind of shit, it's because of Jaws. Before this movies would come out and the studio would be like oh did that make a little bit of money cool success yeah. after jaws it's like no you gotta make a you gotta make fuck ton so of money. much money or else it's a failure it's called a tentpole movie yes and it's it's because it holds up the rest of the studio yep. and like maybe down there on the other sides of the the tent you can make little movies that just like barely clear their budget but you need your tent poles after jaws because mm -hmm. that brings in all the money yeah and it, it, you get all the the fran the merchandising there's uh jaws merchandise all over and and star wars would continue the the one two punch of jaws and star wars yep changed movies changed that's movies it. forever that's it yep uh and this is why we have the plague of pg-13 <laughs> horror movies because horror especially now is like shit we have to be way more accessible so we can make more money mm. You know? are, you, are you talking about in the late 70s? Just in general. Oh, okay. Like, we still deal with this because we're still, again, Jaws changed everything. So we're still dealing with tentpole movies. Yeah. So that's why studios don't want to take risks on, like, rated R horror. Luckily, it, I'm hoping, you know, is a, is a sea change for horror because that was a rated R horror that made a ton of money. But historically, rated R horror doesn't make a lot of money. So that's why you get kind of shitty PG-13 horror where it's like, eh. Mm-hmm. Because it's trying to be as broadly appealing as possible. We're not taking risks. We're not like pushing boundaries. You yeah. Know? And I think Jaws also came out in the summer. And that was yep. the start of the summer movie, the yep. summer blockbuster. Yeah. So horror either, you know, it, it becomes this, you know, blander, uh, more mainstream. Or you get, you know, horror that has to go indie to do what it wants. You know, lower budgets or home video release, you know, so that they're free to kind of make the movie that they want. Uh, Jaws changed everything. Yep. Big no. marketing campaign for the movie, which now is like normal, but Jaws was doing like the talk show thing, releasing clips before the movie, stuff like that, which now this is, you know, I, I especially thought of like comic book movies because Jaws is based on a book. There's already fans of this book. So they're hyping up like the fans of this book, like Jaws is coming to the big screen. We're going to show you clips. We're going to like do a whole thing, which now you get with all the, you know, big summer movies. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets super hyped months before and you feel like you've seen the whole thing, but you don't care. Yeah. Jaws is one of the hottest properties in the film world this year. The book was an instant hit in America, and the film rights were commensurately costly. To shoot for 13 weeks at a budget of over a million pounds is something of a rarity these days. So the producers, Richard Zanuck and David Brown, must have a lot of faith in their property, and even more in their director, Mr. Spielberg. Nominated for four Oscars, including Best Picture. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, it deserved those nominations, man. It's, it's a, a, yeah, it's really good. It's a good movie. It was made by Steven Spielberg when he was, I think, twenty six. Yeah, it this sucks. fucking guy. It sucks. I mean, that's why Spielberg though is because he was able to make <laughs> the movie that changed the the industry when he was twenty six years old. Yeah. And if you're young and you think that's old, it's not old. Yep. That's <laughs> it's young as fuck. Yeah, and holy shit, it was not an easy film to make. The no. uh, the shark was infamously uh, glitchy. 
mm-hmm. Bruce, they named it after yeah. Spielberg's lawyer, but just like shooting out in the water and you got this young fucking director trying to to just rein in this crew of much older people. Yeah. Oh who my like, God, directing fucking Robert Shaw, who's this acclaimed British actor. Yeah. I can't imagine being Spielberg telling fucking Shaw what to do. He did it though. I think there was like, I think there was some resentment on set from all these experienced actors and crew of like this young filmmaker who's, by this kid. Yeah, who's like, no, we have to go in the water and get these shots that are like a pain in the ass to get. Yeah fucking turned out man yeah yeah and then yeah you get the franchise after with all the gimmicks which was not the norm at the time now everything we got sequels for everything how quickly did jaws 2 come out i don't don't know i don't have that written down okay i feel like maybe 78 i feel like pretty soon after and then jaws 3 was the 3d one Mm -hmm. but are we ready to move on i think so. because before we do i do want to i just i just realized there is an omission on here okay that i would like to ask you why okay the reasoning behind it 1973's The Exorcist. Oh, I I did have it on, and then I took it out because I just didn't have enough notes on it. <laughs> oh, okay, we can talk about it though. Uh, I the the reason I thought of it critically was because acclaimed. it was acclaimed, critically acclaimed, yep. also nominated for I believe best, best picture. picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I I think besides that, besides the critical acclaim, I couldn't find a lasting change that it had necessarily it, it didn't on the necessarily genre. spark like a supernatural catholicism <sighs> religious based uh subgenre because when when was the omen that was later in the 70s i think yeah 78. but uh when was rosemary's baby was that before that was previous I, I believe that was before the exorcist i mean yeah the exorcist you know we do have so many exorcism movies in general mm-hmm. it, it's worth talking i just i couldn't like you know there wasn't as much I could pull from it that we also didn't get with Jaws where we're like, you know, we're starting to see horror get awards and maybe become more mainstream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also based on a book and, you know. Yeah. Uh, Besides those two, is the only other horror films nominated for Best Picture um, Silence of the Lambs in 91 and now Get Out? And if you want to throw Black Swan in there, I'm not sure. I I feel like Black Swan could come. It's horror adjacent, at least. Yeah. But yeah, uh, horror is, as we all know, notoriously ignored critically. Mm-hmm. But uh, there are some standouts. Yeah. That break through. Because that's the thing too is like you know yeah The Exorcist was critically acclaimed, but that didn't like make horror somehow critically acceptable. It was kind of an outlier. I think yeah. it was an important movie, but it wasn't like everything was totally different after it came out something like jaws everything was totally different or like our next movie yeah halloween halloween that's one where everything's different after yeah. halloween comes and it's, out. it's on a smaller scale than jaws because it didn't just destroy the industry like it yeah and destroy i'm not saying like on a, a yeah. judgment based i'm just saying blow it up uh in such a way but halloween definitely did that to the horror genre yeah, it, it was it was it was a localized version of that kind of disruption, mm-hmm. and uh, so yeah, that was Halloween, nineteen seventy eight, John Carpenter's, and like we've said many times, there were slasher movies before this, mm-hmm. dating back to Psycho, including Black Christmas, which just came out nineteen seventy four, four years prior, with a lot of the same elements, yeah, including the opening shot of the killer's POV based on a holiday. Yeah, I asked people to guess what they thought you know, we'd be talking about on this episode. A lot of people said Black Christmas and, you know, I I do want to like at least mention it because yeah, it's worth being talked about. It's just Black Christmas didn't spawn slashers like Halloween did. It came first and, you dude, you could go ahead and argue that Halloween did nothing different than Black Christmas. Sure. You could go ahead and argue that and you wouldn't be wrong. But, but the Halloween difference is... is the one that people went and went yeah. nuts for Halloween it. grabbed people and maybe it was Black Christmas was a Canadian movie yeah so maybe that's why but for whatever reason sometimes you make two things that are the exact same one of them just grabs people yeah and that's what Halloween did yeah Halloween gives us probably the most famous final girl oh in yeah horror. Laurie Strode mm-hmm. Jamie Lee Curtis mm-hmm. built her career off that uh, young 20 20 years old, 20, I believe, yeah. when she was doing it. Yeah, so this kind of, again, it really solidifies all the tropes of slashers. If Texas Chainsaw kind of laid the ground for it, now Halloween is, like, solidified. Like, these are slasher horror tropes. Yeah. We've got the victims are hot teens. Hot teens and who get naked. Who get naked, and they have sex, and they smoke. and Well, except the final girl. Except the final girl, exactly. <laughs> Which, you know, again, is going to be its whole episode. Uh 
people have said, you know, it, it's kind of fucked up that the teens who have sex and who oh, are yeah. doing stuff get killed. But our final girl, who is like virginal and perfect, gets to live. And I know John Carpenter and um, oh, was, was it Deborah Hill is mm-hmm. uh, the co-writer. She said we did, you know, like that wasn't intentional at all. It was just a way to have her friends be distracted and Lori not be distracted which you know what fair yeah i think either reading of that is fair i could totally believe again it's like a night of the living dead thing where like i can believe something is not intentional Mm -hmm. but there's readings that arise that are hard to shake you know once you make that connection so i think both answers can be true i think it's complicated halloween oh my god so good uh another one where the music is such a big part of the movie Mm -hmm. composed by the director himself john carpenter which I always love Mm -hmm. the fact that he also composed it. And he puts his name above the movie. It's John Carpenter's Halloween. So we get like horror auteur. Yeah. You know. Yep. Critically acclaimed. Small budget. Small distributor. Indie film. And uh, yep. Again. Get our slashers of the 80s. So that's yeah. where our Friday the 13th comes from. And like we mentioned with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I think one of the big things with Halloween is that it's. It's suburbia, dude. This mm-hmm. is this is your backyard. Mm-hmm. This is middle America. These people aren't, they're not out in the countryside. They're not in a scary inner city. They are in the wholesome, safe, middle-class suburbia. Yep. And they are getting slashed to death by a, a faceless killer. Yeah, that that is true. Because also, you know, like Friday the 13th too, it's, it's a setting that should be wholesome. Like it's summer camp. Mm-hmm. It's a safe place to be or it should be. Whereas Texas Chainsaw, it's, it's teens going on a road trip, picking up hitchhikers. Most normal, you know, wholesome Americans aren't doing that. Same with something like Last House. It's two girls who are like going off to a concert and being like, you know, they want to go get drugs. And yeah, that's... the beginning of that movie is a lot of like, you're you're mm-hmm. not behaving yeah, properly. Exactly. You're not wearing a bra. <laughs> yeah, but this is like the characters in this haven't done anything to like. The babysitters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that's that's huge, I think, and that probably played into the just the the terror that people experienced watching this. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael Myers is great. Yeah, the shape. You yeah, know? That's, I didn't know he was called the shape. And Friday the Thirteenth is not on our list in this episode. Uh, I would say that Friday the Thirteenth mostly just took the things that Halloween did and varied them a little. Uh, the cool thing about Friday the 13th was that it was kind of a whodunit, even though I would argue not a w- very well done whodunit because it's like Pamela comes out of nowhere in the end. But it's also cool with Friday the 13th that it's this middle-aged woman who's mm-hmm. the killer. That's different. Mm-hmm. But aside from that, I would say it's mostly these Halloween elements down to the point of view shots, which, again, came from earlier films, too. But just, you know, kids getting killed. The yeah. the the virginal final girl is also in Friday the 13th. All her friends are more likely to be smoking and drinking and they get killed. Shout outs like we we did earlier, Nightmare on Elm Street. You yeah. know, you could argue with the, the wisecracking yeah, the, villain. Yeah, the funny killer. Because that was 84. Yeah. And uh, Child's Play was 88. Yeah. So you have that kind of evolution. Other uh, notable film, because again, late 80s, early 90s are just this weird spot in horror to me because it feels like it's just sequel sequel sequels you do have some candy man comes out during candy this time man, yeah it's not huge but it's cool hellraiser hellraiser's late 80s uh british snm horror that's yeah. fun uh again didn't really spark a subgenre. yeah silence of the lambs uh not that was 91 91 yeah yeah and that's kind of true crime as and again another critically acclaimed super horror. critically acclaimed yeah but for the most part, I feel like it's a lot of rehashing of stuff that started in the late, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. We're not getting a shift that's as crazy big as the next movie we're going to talk about. Yeah. Is I think the issue I was having is like nothing compared to the change that Halloween brought yeah. and nothing compared to the changes that Scream brought Screaming. so it was hard for me to find something that fit between those two. If you have, you know, if. You could think of one. Yeah, let us know. Let us know. God, you know what? Like looking at this list, the ones we've talked about are all really important, and the ones that we're going to talk about are all really important. But I feel like it's Halloween and Scream. If I had to pick two for impact on the horror genre, I feel like it's Halloween and Scream, dude. 
like I was just saying, I feel like the horror genre at this point in time, Scream was 1996, is kind of in a sad state. I mm-hmm. feel like it's not getting taken seriously. Mm-hmm. No one is, uh, yeah, no one's seeking these movies out. Like you say in these notes, uh, most of the time it's it's actors in their first roles. Yeah. They're cutting their teeth in these horror movies. Yep. Fucking... It's their dirty secret that they don't talk about. Yeah. Later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fucking Scream, dude. Yep. So it's big, big names of this movie. Studio movie. It's super glossy, super well made, super uh, relatable and hip. Yes, this Very is like cool. an MTV era movie. Yeah, you know? this is like horror explicitly trying to appeal to teens and like cool teens. Cool teens, and it's that. fucking funny. It is. It's very funny. But the biggest thing is that it's aware of horror movies. Yeah, it is aware of of the genre. And the the thirty years that came before it, and the tropes, and the traditions, and the characters know the movies, and they're calling them out by name. They're sitting there watching Halloween on the TV, mm-hmm. like like by this point in time, it's nineteen ninety six. Horror movies have existed uh, in in very strong fashion for like twenty years, you mm-hmm. know, longer than that. But like as a real prominent genre with hardcore fans, uh, about twenty years, and so these characters are those fans. Yeah. You know, you know that you, the viewer and listener knows that horror as a genre has like, it's a cult genre. The fan base is dedicated and loyal and fucking into it. Mm -hmm. And that's what these characters are. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so cool. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, we don't get movies like, uh, cabin in the woods. You're next. I've Tucker and Dale on here. I feel like a lot to scream. The idea of being self-referential and meta and deconstructing themselves. Yeah, Behind the Mask, The uh, Rise of Leslie Vernon. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's like a mockumentary about a a serial killer who knows that he's like a serial killer from a movie, like a slasher serial killer. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, it's it's so good. Yeah, it also kind of breathed life back into slashers and oh my God, made them a little it. more sexy and cool. Get urban legend, and I, I know what you did last summer. Valentine, I think, is yeah. another. Uh, yeah, these imitators who and the the interesting thing about all those movies, including Scream, is that there's not nudity in them. No, they're like young and hip, but they're not. It's not sleaze. Like, it's not sleaze it's not like eighty like slashers. Sleaze, yeah. yeah, you could even argue that the violence is scaled back a little bit. These aren't Friday the Thirteenth kills. I'd, I'd say the first Scream has some fun, uh, interesting kills to it, but a lot of these are just like people getting stabbed. Yeah, which kind of brings it down to a more realistic level. That's the thing about Scream is that it's not it's not Jason out there, this hulking uh supernatural being hunting you down. It's your fucking classmates. Yeah. And this is before Columbine happened, mm-hmm. although uh like I say in the Kill Count for Scream 3, that happened that coincided with Columbine and created a whole bunch of issues, but like this is this is like terror in the home. Yeah. This is terror uh much like Halloween brought the terror to the suburbs. This is terror in the home, in the classroom, in the school, mm-hmm. in the neighborhood. And um, I think one of the other really cool things about Scream is the whodunit aspect. Because the whole time you can sit there and guess who it is. And, and maybe you'll figure it out. And then to have two killers. Yeah. That's a fun little uh, twist on the on that. Yeah, for sure. And so the idea, yeah, like factoring in like the whodunit, you know, you're, you're maybe a little more mentally engaged during that kind of movie. Also, you know, kind of trying to see... Or trying to process the satire of it. Like, you're a little more engaged the whole movie. So it's like horror is something more highbrow, a little more intelligent. Um, And so this brings in a shift of what kind of actors are starting to show up in horror. You know, we've got Jennifer Love Hewitt's doing horror and Sarah Michelle Gellar. Like, these are cool celebs. Because Drew Barrymore was well-known at this point. Yeah, Drew Barrymore. And it was like like the psycho thing where they kill her. Right away. She was on all those fucking posters, dude. Yeah. She was on all those posters and all those commercials, and they kill her in 15 minutes, yeah. man. And it was like, whoa, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have Paris Hilton in House of Wax. I remember <laughs> yeah. when that happened. That's a little later, but I feel like that's kind of a direct, <laughs> you know, result of Scream, mm-hmm. making it, like, cool to be in horror. And that's the thing, is that Scream made horror cool. It Scream did. Scream brought people to the theater to see horror movies again. Yeah. And just spawned this huge influx of, of movies. Yeah. And I feel like maybe Scream, I, I have that Scream maybe being a reason for Jamie Lee Curtis showing up in H2O. Uh, what do you, oh, yeah. 
That's fair. Yeah. Because by by this point, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis started in Halloween and then became an A-list star. Yeah. She, you know, countless movies, uh, huge celebrity, but yet she returned for Halloween H2O, which Halloween H2O is very much a Scream-influenced movie. Mm -hmm. It's more self-aware. It's more humorous. Uh, it's it's a soft reboot kind of of the series, mm-hmm. and yeah, it was uh, because of Scream making horror cool. Jamie Lee Curtis was willing to come back. She wasn't about to be in Halloween four through six. Those flaming right <laughs> exactly. Garbage heaps. I think yeah. I think Scream marked a shift. Where it was like, okay, I'll come back and be in this one, and you know now she's gonna be back for the sequel, the also called Halloween sequel. Oh, <laughs> Halloween, god damn it. Uh, uh, Jason X also a a uh, Scream influenced movie. It's funny. Mm-hmm. It's it's kind of meta. It's uh, a little bit self aware. So, yeah, it's like Scream. I I will always sing the praises of Scream. Yeah. I think it is near perfect. Yeah, with the the balance of the tone that it strikes. It's it's hilarious. It's self aware, and yet it's still violent mm-hmm. and scary and suspenseful. I fucking love Scream. Dude. Yeah. I fucking love Scream. It's also a very like cozy mid nineties thing that for the age we are, I think yeah. is like really I mean, nice. it's one of the earliest horror movies I ever remember watching, running away from the living room in that opening scene. I just it's I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Profoundly impactful. Yeah. And it also kind of marks a, a moment in horror where the genre, like you said, has a legit history and there's stuff that we can draw from. Yeah. From this point onward, it's like Oh, yeah, horror. It's that genre where these tropes exist. Yeah, where there's a big scary murderer with a machete or a chainsaw, and he kills a bunch of teens. And they run upstairs instead of going out the front door. It's like calling out all these things. Exactly. God, I love you, Scream. Thanks, Wes. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. For instance, number one, you can never have sex. My next movie I put on here for reasons that I think are different than maybe reasons other people would put it on here. Yeah, because originally I disagreed with the inclusion of this movie, but then you explained why you put it on. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1999 is The Blair Witch Project. Yes. Now, uh, I disagreed with putting it on because as far as found footage movies go, mm-hmm. although Blair Witch was one of the earliest, not the earliest, there are always examples yeah, that the come Holocaust before. Yeah, Holocaust came before. Uh I believe Paranormal Activity, which we'll talk about later, is the is the spark of the found footage subgenre that really took off. Blair Witch kind of came and was its own thing. Yes. And you agreed with that. Mm-hmm. And yet you put it on this list, but mm-hmm. for a different reason. Yes. So we've got, let me, I'll explain the lead up to Blair Witch. So we're in the Scream era mm-hmm. of film. Big names, big actors, like big, big, big. Everything is very beautifully shot, expensive. Then we got Blair Witch. Low budget, shot on camcorders, unknown actors. Um, you know, again, Cannibal Holocaust is a predecessor, uh, but it didn't impact the genre like Blair Witch did in the way that I'm going to explain. Uh, there's parallels where people thought Cannibal Holocaust was real and the director got arrested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They arrested that dude because they thought it, he made a snuff film. I mean, he did kill some animals. He did, yeah. Was it Tarantula? A turtle. A turtle? Yeah, I haven't seen that movie. I haven't seen it either. I haven't seen that movie because I'm like, I don't want to watch a turtle get killed. I know. Like, I'm good. Yeah, I should probably watch it, though. Yeah. See a snake get killed in Friday the 13th. That sucks. Yeah. Then we get Blair Witch, which I did not put on here, like we just discussed, because it's a found footage movie and one of the first. I think it's super impactful because it changed movie marketing. Like, movie marketing is completely different after Blair Witch. So, because Blair Witch is the first movie to use the internet in such an amazing way. Yeah. Uh, for younger listeners and viewers, remember that in 1999, the internet was not something that most, most people, people were used. on. You had to be a certain kind of nerd to be on the internet. Yeah. I believe I may have been around this time. I was. Yeah. We had, we had internet. And um, yeah, even up through like mid 2000s, nerds were on the internet. Yeah. The internet was not like the place where you just hang out and do shit, where everyone's on it now. I would say like it wasn't until like 2007, maybe. Yeah. Because of that like it Facebook was, and stuff. Because Facebook made it regular to be on the internet yeah. if you weren't a nerd. Pre Facebook is like you're a nerd and you want to go on a message board for people who also like this specific thing yeah and it, it, internet was way more way niche. way different yeah. and because of this uh the Blair Witch Project is able to market this film as being a real story 
and spread this urban legend throughout the internet because there's also not a centralized place on the internet where people can like go to debunk this story. Yeah. Now, if they try, if anyone tried to do this now, you'd have Twitter prove it's fake immediately and it would be like a Twitter moment where yeah. everyone clicks on it and is like, oh, this thing's fake. And we all know it's fake. Whereas back then, if you hear about the Blair Witch Project, you have to go seek out whether or not it's fake. And you're going to be coming through like message boards and shit to figure out like if this thing's real or not. It's a different yeah, environment. It's, I mean, it's uh, just to get a little off topic here, but it's Web 1.0. Because yeah. Web 2.0 is social media. And, you know, nowadays when you go on the Internet, you kind of have a central site to go to whether it's reddit or mm -hmm. facebook or mm -hmm. twitter you have a place where you go to and you see an aggregate of everything else yes. that everyone else is looking at yeah stuff was not aggregated Dude, back, back then. then it was such a darker place and i don't mean darker like tonally just like it felt like you were in a tunnel yeah and you had to like find your own stuff through search engines and like be lucky enough if you came across and a that's website. what web rings were for Oh, fucking web rings. Right. Holy shit. Web rings were like. We don't need those anymore because everything is an aggregate. But web rings are like a button at the bottom of web pages where it's like, I'm part of this web ring. And you click to like the next website in the web ring. So you have this like circle of websites. I forgot that all, all about web exactly. rings. Yeah. That's they're why like, they existed. They're like homemade sites on Homestead yeah. or Angel Fire or Lycos. I had an Angel Fire site. And then, yeah, you would join like the horror movie web ring. Right. And at the bottom of your site, you would have links so that people could find other sites. Right. Wow. So now here comes Blair Witch and they're able to plant marketing for this movie in Web 1.0. Yeah. Where it's harder to debunk. You, it, it, They create this mystery online where it's harder to piece everything together. It's harder to like research the people who are part of this because that information isn't readily yeah, available. Yeah, people aren't on the internet. On, on the IMDb, which IMDb, I always forget, existed in 1999. But oh, that's so weird. It ex uh, on, on the IMDb pages for the actors of Blair Witch, they were listed as missing and presumed dead. Oh, nice. Yeah. Super cool. Super, super cool. Um, so, but yeah, people like the main, you know, mainstream movie going audience, people who are on the internet, they go into this thinking it's real. A lot of people saw this and thought it was real. For sure. It scared the shit out of people. It scared me. I was a kid and thinking this thing's real. Yeah. Cause like, again, found footage is not a well-known, uh, style no. back then. Cause cannibal Holocaust is a very. No one knows. Even now people don't know. Cannibal yeah. Holocaust. Yeah. If you're a regular movie goer, you don't know what the fuck that is. You go and watch Blair Witch where it's literally filmed on a camcorder. And it's presented to you as this is real footage. Yeah. We found these tapes. You fucking believe you it. You think it's real. In 1999, you've never heard of anything like that yeah. before. Yeah, and the people, the filmmakers, like they they filmed fake police interviews, fake news real footage. Did they have the actors kind of like lay low? Yeah, they yeah. had to like, the actors basically had to like drop off the face of the earth and pretend they didn't exist. So this it's is viral so marketing. Cool. And now yes. viral marketing happens a lot. Exactly. And it's cool. It's always fun when you come up, when you see like a new way that it's being done. Yeah. Uh, That's not a... um. Uh, that's not called in as a bomb threat. <laughs> Aqua Teen Hunger Aqua Force Teen movie. Hunger Force. <laughs> oh man, I remember that. That was good times. That was in Boston, right? Yeah, I believe it was. Um, yeah. <laughs> a, a good example I can think of, and something I was obsessed with. I followed this like every day. I would go online and like follow, like like read the latest updates. Is the Cloverfield marketing? Hell yeah. In 2005 oh was it that early no maybe it was a little later well I, I think leading up to it would have been like a couple of years leading up to this movie because they released a teaser trailer and we were all like what the fuck is this yeah because it was this super ambiguous trailer no one knew what it was i remember back in the day when we all thought the cloverfield monster was gonna be a giant lion because there oh, was yeah. a tra there was a line in the trailer where someone <laughs> screams what is it is it coming this way I thought it's alive, it's huge! And I think now we know it's alive, it's huge. But everyone thought he said, it's a lion, it's huge. And oh so my God. it was like a meme before we had memes, but it was a meme where everyone thought the monster was going to be a giant lion. Also, people thought it was going to be Megatron. That's so fun. It was so fun. That was a fun time on the internet. But yeah. it was a big, they have this whole like immersive story where they have these fake company websites set up for this slusho company it was like a like a slurpy type company mm -hmm. and you dig around in that and there's all kinds of like weird corporate fake corporate sites and stuff it's really cool but very similar to like a blair witch kind of thing yeah other examples you have here um borat being like a real person yeah, yeah. it's hard to remember a time when people thought borat was real but like a lot of people thought borat was real all the marketing was like him as a real dude and they created this whole world where he was like a real guy and they yeah. used the internet for that. Dark Knight used the internet really well. Mm -hmm. 
And that wasn't them pretending stuff was real, but they they basically did like an augmented reality thing where there was real life scavenger hunts and you could call phone numbers. Like we were all, we called the phone numbers. I followed this a lot too. You could call the phone and like hear the Joker and stuff and you'd have to like oh, dial cool. all their phone numbers to like do a scavenger hunt kind of. But this is like, you know, it's it's augmenting your reality. It's making this movie feel real, which is what Blair, you know, Blair Witch did. Blair Witch augmented our reality, you know, planted this fake story, handed out missing people, like missing persons posters at screenings with everyone handing them out being like straight up about it like please like if you if you've heard anything about them please call us like it's playing so it like it's real um even like even stuff like pop-ups like simpsons movie did like the quickie mart and what oh, gilmore yeah. girls did luke's diner like i i really think that that's the impact of the blair witch project is this immersive marketing this is like the real world yeah becoming you know, part of the movie. Like you're able to kind of, it's like a tangible thing. Yeah. You know. So it's very cool. Mm -hmm. Very influential in that regard. And I applaud you for uh, including it and like looking past just its its style, Mm -hmm. uh, filmmaking style. Yeah. I I think that that's the biggest impact it has. It it just changed the way we use the internet. Yeah. Basically. Next is everyone's favorite everyone's favorite movie that never presents any problems when you try to cover it online it's saw i was gonna try and grab billy but he's really oh, large oh we have two of them great yeah. we have two of them okay it's saw if you can't you, if you're just listening to this james now has a billy puppet on his lap <laughs> yep this isn't weird uh so saw is 2004 and and pre-saw we're in a weird again like a like you mentioned earlier a weird late 80s era where it's like sequels 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 yeah weird it, maybe some remakes and nothing original like it's all scream just, knockoffs yeah we're yeah. getting yeah and um, uh i mean that that's the kind of nature of the genre and most things in life yeah. is just it's cyclical you yeah. know yeah, yeah because uh like you said S- blair witch was so impactful because it was um realistic which was a contrast to Scream, which was uh, glossy and well produced. Mm-hmm. But Scream at the time was a contrast to the lesser produced and glossy films right. before. It yeah. just goes back and forth. It goes it, yeah. it, like ping pongs back and forth. Yeah. So here comes Saw. Oh God. And is like gritty and gross <sighs> and real. It's uh yeah. Saw and Hostel, which came out the same year, I believe, same time. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest things that those do is they they they're gruesome and they want to make the audience squirm. Yes. And whereas previous movies, including like you know the Friday the Thirteenth and stuff, they were very violent. They had very uh, sometimes very graphic deaths, but they were all they always had this hint of unrealisticness to them. You yeah. Know? They're always kind of fantastical. They're uh, those kinds of movies you could bring a popcorn to and have fun and maybe cheer and feel guilty about it, but it's like a forbidden, like it's fun, you yeah. know? Saw is not like a popcorn horror. No. It's a cerebral, really grounded, you know, you're not like cheering when Gary Ellis is just <laughs> sawing his foot off, you know? Yeah. And it's not quite the same. And especially as the sequels would go on and get more and more and more graphic. Uh, but these movies just, they, they focus and they hold and they linger on that violence. And it's it's done with realistic makeup and effects that like, you know, it turns it into almost like a medical procedure. And Saw 4 has that, that uh, yeah. autopsy in the beginning. And Saw 3 has the the brain surgery in it where it's like, it's crossing the line from like, but, but it's hard to tell that the line is crossed because everything you've seen before it and all the deaths has been just as graphic and yeah. realistic as these medical procedures. It It is it, like Saw is one I just I vividly remember coming out because everyone was talking about it. And I was so terrified of seeing it because the way it was hyped up was that it was so disgusting and so real mm-hmm. that I remember being very like turned off by that. Like, and a lot of people were, this was very controversial. People still people, cite this oh, as yeah. like a distasteful horror. Yeah. It's Scream gross. 4. It's torture porn. It's- Scream 4 has the line about like, uh, I hate all that torture porn shit. Yeah, it's exactly. just gross. It's not scary. Exactly. And I mean, I would say the first saw is a little scary in its premise and everything, but, uh, you know, just because it's not scary. Most horror movies aren't scary. Yeah. They're trying to do different things. And Saw is very successful at what it's trying to do, man, which is yeah, be gruesome. And the first one, you know, 
gets more of a bad rap, I think, because of the sequels. But the first one isn't as gruesome, and it has a lot of other shit going on, mm-hmm. like the twists and it shit. It is like a mystery kind it's of. It's a mystery, it's, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's like, who's Jigsaw? Mm-hmm. And uh, But who's yeah, Jigsaw, Saw, probably? I think, uh, creates this trend of horror just heightening itself. Yeah. We get martyrs. We get human centipede. Martyrs. We get a Serbian film. Like films that are meant to just be fucked up. Mm. And that's the way in which they're trying to be quote unquote scary. Yeah. You know? Where it's like if you've seen them, it's like a badge of like how much fucked up stuff can you handle? Yeah. You know? And I mean, these aren't my favorite films. I hate martyrs. I don't like martyrs either. Uh, I have I w- not seen a Serbian film and I have no desire to. I've not seen a Serbian film. I like human centipede. You like Human Centipede. I wasn't impressed. <laughs> I really So like yeah, these it. aren't my favorite films, but yeah. they uh I feel like they they had to happen, you know? Mm. You, you have you have all these uh, you have 30 years of films uh playing around and with more implied violence or like we said more fantastical violence. Mm-hmm. Some people want to see some people just want to push those boundaries. Yeah. And so it had to happen. Yeah. And if that's what you're into, that's fine. Yeah. Uh also, yeah, like you have here written, I think the time was was uh ripe for this with because it's post nine eleven. Post nine eleven. It changed media. Yeah. Media became so different after that. And this becomes, you know, like the the thing we're afraid of in this moment is human on human violence because the entire culture, especially America, we're so impacted by that. Yeah. So our media reflects that these are like humans torturing other humans. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, many times, without reason. I mean, Saw has Jigsaw has, has an ideology, code, but... but movies like it that would uh, linger in the violence and gore, like Saw does, mm-hmm. uh, are more just random acts of violence. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so everything around this time also, I. I feel starts justifying itself with explanations for everything. So even stuff where it's not human on human violence, it's like it's explained with science. Zombie movies around this time, like 28 days later and stuff. It's like a medical, like we have a reason for it. It's like an outbreak of a disease. It's not like zombies just exist like night of the living dead. There's not, an explanation. I don't think. There's like think. a vague, vague like satellite or some shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But but <laughs> and then the like the descent. Um, you know, these are creatures that were human, like they're a cousin, a close cousin of human, and they evolved to be this way. So there's this very scientific explanation. So everything is like rooted in real world. This could happen. There's not a ton of straight up monster movies during this time or like, you know, I think there's a trend of everything being real or possible. Mm hmm. Because that's what freaks us out the most, I think, in the 2000s. Last movie on our list. Yeah. I want you to talk about this one mostly because I think you you have the most feelings about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mentioned it earlier. Paranormal Activity Mm -hmm. came out in 2007. And yeah, really set off a found footage craze. Honestly, I, uh, I love Paranormal Activity. I think it's very cool. I think that part of the reason I love it is because I, too, had a camcorder from a very young age. So... Uh, same thing with Blair Witch. By the time Blair Witch came out, I was used to watching that kind of footage because mm-hmm. I was making it at home and watching it. So when people would complain about the motion sickness, I was like, what? That's what it looks I, like. I've never gotten motion sick from stuff yeah. like that. So Paranormal Activity was cool because it was like, oh, it's a movie uh, made with what I'm used to seeing all the time. And um, obviously, it it really grabbed a hold of, of the audience because we got a whole bunch of them after this. Mm-hmm. Uh, not only just imitators, but also sequels to the Paranormal Activity movies, which some are great. Fucking Paranormal Activity 3 is a yeah. I only seen the first one. I think the first one gets a bad rap. It does. It's, yeah. I mean, a lot of these movies get a bad rap just because of like, oh, there's a backlash to them. Scream, some people are like, it's overrated. No, fuck you. Oh, no. Scream, Scream is, is amazing. Great. Get uh, out of here. But yeah, Blair Witch gets a lot of hate. I love Blair Witch. And I, love I think it. Blair Witch is terrifying. Mm-hmm. And I could, I could do a whole episode about Blair Witch and why it's good. And haters back off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but like many movies on this list, Paranormal Activity was made with no money. Mm-hmm. It was made uh, very cheaply, and yet it made a ton of money. And that's, I mean, that's part it of the reason why these so much spawn money, imitators dude. is because they're made for cheap and they make a fuck ton of money. And then everyone else is like, well, let's do that then. That's great. That's great for our bottom line. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it had these actors who were like non-actors, kind of. They're just very real people. Mm-hmm. And uh, Katie Featherstone and Mike uh, something, I forgot his last name, but I only know her last name because she was just at Texas Frightmare. Uh, oh, yeah, she was. Mm-hmm. It brought back 
the supernatural and or yeah. like you have written down here. Yeah, because if you notice, you know, before this, it's again stuff like Saw, Hostel. It's like gritty, gross, real. Uh, but then we get Paranormal Activity. And then right around this time, we also start getting, uh, again, James Wan starting a second horror movement. Wan is up there now. I Yeah. With Craven and yep. the Masters. Wan is the latest addition, I think, to the, the Horror Hall of Fame. I don't think many people can say that they've started two very different horror movements. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Because you're talking about Saw and The Conjuring. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like his brand of supernatural stuff is like a very specific type of horror that mm -hmm. people try to emulate. Um, so I guess we could have put like an insidious on here, but I kind of lumped it in with, you know, a paranormal activity like supernatural coming back into horror. It's monster movies, it's ghost movies, demons, whatever. Uh, but paranormal activity is, is just so good with the, the found footage conceit that it's you're watching footage that someone filmed on their home camera, much like Blair Witch, but... Uh, this takes it out of the woods and into the home, mm -hmm. which is really good. It One of the coolest things I think about it is that it uh, conditions you to be afraid of a shot. The shot that uh, Micah sets up the camera every night when they go to sleep, and there's just a little bit of spooky stuff in some of those shots so that when every time he sets up that shot, you're tense, and you're like, what's going to be scary? And sometimes it's nothing. You go through, and then it's morning. Yeah. And it, but like, it's like time lapse of them sleeping, and nothing really happens. Yeah, but like the fact that it was able to classically condition you to be afraid of a shot, I think is very cool, uh, very cool psychological yeah. element to the film. It is one I wish I saw in theaters. I didn't see it in theaters. We watched it together at home, yeah. but even still, every time that shot came around, I was like, oh, oh and no. pulled the blanket up on yeah. my head. Yeah, it's a good one. I think very... Yeah, I think I think yeah, it gets a lot of flack in the same way that Blair Witch does, and I think I like both of those because they do so much with so little, and they, the way that they suggest something that's terrifying, makes it so scary for me because then my imagination just goes nuts. Yeah, yeah. and like we said, uh, the main reason I would say it was influential, or the main way in which it was influential, is just so many found footage, footage movies after this, yeah. and I like them. Uh, as a whole, I used to like them more, but you know, there's so many bad ones. There's so many bad ones, and the the tricks that are used in them, yeah, just get repeated over and over and over. My favorite is always the no, keep keep filming, keep filming, we have to keep filming. Yeah, <laughs> you know? there's a lot. Of... They always have to find a reason for this poor cameraman to <laughs> always keep filming. <laughs> yeah, like there's so many different uh, things that you just see repeated ad nauseum. So that by time we watch Grave Encounters, which a lot of people love. I was like, it's not doing anything new for me. I've seen yeah. all this shit in, in found footage movies previously. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the movies that we have on our list. Um, yeah, I stopped there because, you know, once you get closer to present day, it's hard to tell. Yeah, you can't tell. Like, uh, what's going to be the one that, because there's so many right now that stick out to me as really good. Like, Get Out, I think could be, someone could be like, well, that changed stuff. And it's like, we, who knows? We don't know that yet. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard to to separate the j movies that are just really good and what are influential, right? Because like The Witch, I think is amazing. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna spawn in a bunch of imitators. No. Um, Get Out maybe could be the start of a new era of uh, horror getting more critical acclaim, mm -hmm. or maybe uh, horror that speaks more to social issues, mm -hmm. which you might be able to lump in It Follows in there, because it's got some commentary going on in it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that It mm -hmm. is can be counted among this in a few years as a, like you said earlier, a big horror movie that's R-rated, yeah. and yet is still hugely successful financially. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what other, any other movies that you can think of that maybe down the line maybe. will be part of this esteemed list i i don't know what movie came first out of all the insidious and the conjuring and all that yeah. stuff but whatever came first it might have been the first insidious uh might earn its own place on this list uh separate from paranormal activity yeah. just because i feel like those movies ha are kind of their own subgenre of like supernatural and also um appealing to i think a, a wider audience than mm -hmm. just the the hardcore horror fan base but i'm not sure yeah i'm not sure I wonder if, if the Babadook could be one that maybe kicked off this trend of kind of highbrow, like it's very allegorical 
Um, you know, like there's there's a deeper meaning to that movie, mm. and it's like a monster supernatural. So I think of after that was like it follows Get mm-hmm. Out, like all these like, you know, there's monsters and there's a supernatural horror, but they all mean something else. Yeah, I that, think the Babadook could be that's a good maybe contender. a good yeah. I'll I'll say that then because I oh. think that was the first like, at least from what I remember in recent years, the first big like monster movie that, you know gained word of mouth because it was really good and you know like an artistic horror yeah if you have any suggestions for movies that either we left out on this list from the past or movies that are more recent that you think could possibly spark something feel free to let us know Mm -hmm. uh, either in the comments on whatever app or website you're listening to this through or you can email us at deadmeatpod at gmail.com yeah we're always available there chelsea goes through all those emails because again this podcast is all Chelsea, man. I'm just here talking into a mic. I don't do anything else. <laughs> so <laughs> thank her for this wonderful content. And uh, I think this was an especially good episode. Yeah, I'm happy fun. with it. Yeah. I like doing the research for it. It was really hard. <laughs> now I just wanted to put every movie on here. Yeah, that was a few days of research on your yeah. end. Uh, but where can people find you? You can find me at Carebeck. That's C-A-R-E-B-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch... Uh, it's at deadmeatstore.com. Yep. She also runs all that. Uh, the Dead Meat Social is Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. Um, the YouTube channel, if you haven't visited yet, <laughs> is <Yeah>. Dead Meat <laughs> on YouTube. Going strong. Uh, it's going well. And, God, is there anything else? I don't think so. I don't know what next week is going to be. Mm-hmm. Probably uh, a movie review. Yeah. Yeah. We... It's like an in between week. Yeah, so we always pepper the movie reviews every other week. They're easier for us to just watch a movie and talk about it. Yeah, it gives me time to do more research if we want to do a researchy one. If you want to suggest to us a movie, let us know. Oh, yeah. We have some ideas. We have some ideas. Mm -hmm. Maybe Idle Hands, man. Oh, man. That's (laughs) so close to, like... Final Destination to me. Oh God, it really Devin Sawa. We could have another Devin no, Safeway movie. No. Yes. <laughs> uh, other than that, though, just uh, keep on keeping on, and make sure to rate and review us on whatever you're listening yeah, to please, us through. Yeah, please help so much. Yeah, like seriously, if you're still listening to this, which is shocking, most people turn off podcasts by this point. Oh, I do. Yeah, I wouldn't be listening to this. <laughs> yeah, fuck you, James. But if you're still <laughs> listening, that means you care. So go uh, write us a review. It doesn't have to be long. Just go write us a review on iTunes. Go to iTunes.com slash Dead Meat Pod. That's probably not the address, but search for it's Dead Meat on. Podcast on iTunes. Give us a little five star and give us a little review. Just say they're uh, they're not bad to listen to. It can just be that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but until uh, next week's podcast, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Meat Podcast. 